My father, John J. Hooker Sr., had a law partner by the name of Seth, uh, Seth Walker. Jack Norman's son, Seth, this Seth that we're talking about, is named Seth Walker Norman after my uncle. And this uncle, Seth Walker, was one of the most attractive men I ever met in my life. And he was the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the State of Tennessee and became great friends with Lynn Motlow, who, who owned the Jack Daniels facility. And Lynn Motlow lived up there at Lynchburg, and he would go to St. Louis, Missouri every weekend to trade on the mule market. And he would t carry in one pocket a, a flask of Jack Daniels whiskey, and the other part pocket a pistol. And so he goes to, to St. Louis, and he trades, usually. And uh, this night, he gets on the train. And the porter, he's on the club car, and only two people on the club car, him and this other fella. And the porter comes back, and he says to the porter, uh, go make up my bed, uh, I got a headache. And the porter says, yes, sir, mister. And he'd go down there every other weekend, so he knew all the porters. I mean, uh, he was a part, that was, it was in their family, so to speak. So go make up my bed. A few minutes, the porter comes back, and he said, porter, what about my bed? Well, I, I, right now, Mr. Pondo, a few minutes later, he comes back. Porter, what, what about my bed? Mr. Pondo, I can't make up your bed until the train leaves the station. They'll fire me if I make up your bed. I can't do it till the train leaves the station. Motlow reaches in that pocket where he has this gun, pulls out this pistol, go make up my goddamn bed. At which point, the conductor of the train, you know how the train has that little L shape where you walk down here and, and then you turn a little bit right there where the bathrooms are, you know, and all that. So the, this, this conductor walks through that little thing, steps right into the main room. The train lurches. Pistol goes off. Kills the conductor. Kills the conductor. Doesn't hit the, the, the water. Kills the conductor. So they indict my boat for murder. So the relevance of this story, incidentally, is it ends up with his family. So uh, uh, they indict him. So they, Montlow gets by. You know, they get a local lawyer in St. Louis, and then but Uncle Seth is the lead man. He goes to Memphis, and this witness, who's on the club car with him, testifies, and he is very anti Montlow. And the witness is a preacher, and in his uh, preacher garb. And he makes it appear as if Motlow was drunk and as if he was a bad man if he, and he intentionally shot this fellow. So Uncle Seth gets up to cross-examine him. And he says to the preacher, Preacher, how, uh, where do you live, preacher? And the preacher said, I live in, in East St. Louis. But he said, this, uh, this uh, accident took place in, in West St. Louis. Uh, uh, or maybe it's the other way around, east and west. Uh, why were you in West St. Louis if you live in East St. Louis? He said, because my, my uh, church is in West St. Louis. Uh, let me understand this now. You live in East St. Louis, but your church is in West St. Louis. Yes. Do you go over that your church every Sunday? Yes, I go every Sunday. You go in the morning, come back in the afternoon? Yes, I go in the morning, come back in the afternoon. Let me ask you this. How much does it cost you to ride on the railroad? It, over and back from east to west. And the preacher says, it doesn't cost me anything. He says, I've got a pass on the railroad. Uncle says, let me see that pass. The preacher reaches in his pocket and says, pass. So, so the can't find the pass. So Uncle Seth says to the judge, Judge, let's have a little recess here. I want to see this pass. About lunchtime. So go, you go get this pass. We'll come back here tomorrow. Bring this pass. So he goes to have an adjournment. He'll come back the next morning. Gets on the preacher gets on the stand. Uncle Seth says, All right, sir, let's see that pass. 
Beach and said, well, uh, Mr. Mr. Walker, I, I, I can't find the pass. I, 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 Uncle Seth said, let me ask you a question. Do you really have a pass? And the fellow said, well, uh, the truth is that I ride on a pass, but it's a pass of one of my uh, people who in the church, and they let me use it every Sunday to ride across. <laughs> Uncle Seth reaches in his wallet, pulls out his wallet, takes out his own pass. He said, he said, preacher, he says, I am the general counsel of the Elden Railroad, the very one on which you were trapped in. And I'm going to show you my pass. Hands in the pass. He said, now look on the back of that pass. <laughs> on the back of that pass, it says, not good if transferred. Not transferred. He said, if you, he said, I'll tell you, preacher, on the back of the pass, you use it. It says not transferable. Now, I, I found out it takes 65 cents to get a round trip ticket from east to west and west to east. He said, I want these gentlemen of the jury to know you come down here and testified against this good man. But the truth is, you are nothing but a 65 cent thief. <laughs> Every Sunday morning, you steal 65 cents from the railroad. <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury, I've got no further questions. <laughs> Sits down. The jury goes out and quits old man Motlow. For which Motlow, for which Uncle Seth got a one-third interest in the Jack Daniels distillery. Nineteen thirty-eight. Nineteen thirty-eight. I'm eight years old. All during the war, I'm a kid living in our house out here on on Harding Road, and it had an enormous basement, bigger than the downsides, bigger than this everything downstairs. Everything in that basement was Jack Daniels cases of Jack Daniels whiskey. It must have been five hundred of them. Cases of Jack Daniels at a time when you couldn't get when you couldn't get whiskey anywhere. He had it in that thing, and and he used to give it to the to the judges and to the legislators. One day when I got grown, I said, Father, I've heard how what a great lawyer you are. I'm going to ask you this question: Do you think it had anything to do with the fact that you were giving that whiskey to old judges? Son, he said, I don't ever thought of it that way myself. But he said, I did give it to him. But he said, to keep the pot right, I'd also give it to the lawyer on the other side. <laughs> so that he wouldn't complain about it. And so he got by with it. He gave it to the legislature. There was a great trial for the legislature. Uh, a guy named Jim Cummings, a guy named I.D. Beasley. Uh, these great historical figures of Tennessee. And he kept them all in this Jack Daniels whiskey. And they met in the afternoon at his law office in his library and mapped out what was going to be in the legislative bill the next day, making that Jack Daniels whiskey. Well, this man's ancestor owned the thing. In, uh, the, uh, the Kelly family owned this place called uh, uh, Jimmy Kelly's down in, uh, uh, down in, the, in the nape of the neck uh, uh, where the Union Street is. This bridge that runs into to uh, Church Street, a little old house, attractive little old place, and they own this uh, thing. Now, uh, we talk about the late 30s and the early 40s, and you couldn't sell liquor uh, uh, in those days, but you could carry your own bottle to the place, and they would store it for you, uh, uh, and, and so you got by with, with going and, and, and drinking on the basis that it was your own bottle. Well, the, the fact is that that whiskey in the, our basement was a large part of those bottles uh, 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 that, <laughs> that, uh, that he would give it to his, his ancestor, his, his family. And so I started going there in about 1939 when I was nine years old. This was one year after this lawsuit down there and, and where they had all this Jack Daniels whiskey. Of course, went there all during the war. Justice William O. Douglas came down there and uh, uh, went to the Jimmy Kelly's with my father. I can remember about 11 years old, he came down to speak at the Tennessee Bar Association. We went down to Jimmy Kelly's and, and, and then drinking that Jack Daniels whiskey and, and, and saluted himself. So, you, if you knew me better, you would know that I claim credit for almost everything in sight. You know? <laughs> 
Uh, you, you've already heard me claim credit for Hospital Corporation of America. <laughs> There's almost nothing I don't claim credit for. Like, uh, this young man used to work for the Tennessee, and I claim credit. If it hadn't been for me, Gannett would have never owned the Tennessee. I am the man. That's true. Huh? That's that's true. true. That I am the man who made it possible. I've told you that before, right? Yeah. He's verified. Yeah, that's true. All right. And so I, would, I want to, to claim credit, but it's the truth that the Jimmy Kelly's was in some degree became popular because of that Jack Daniels whiskey. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> and, and again, during the war, Jimmy Kelly's always had whiskey. There was a real shortage because of Mr. Hooker Sr. that we, we always had whiskey, always had whiskey. But th there was a camp, an army camp, just south of Columbia, where most of the military who were going overseas had to go through there first. And, and those soldiers, before they were shipped out, would come to Nashville for a big time before they were gone to either to the Pacific or to Europe. And they'd come to Jimmy Kelly's, and that's how those soldiers were introduced to Jack Daniels. So after the war, when they went back home to Oregon or New Mexico or Michigan or Maine, they wanted Jack Daniels. So indirectly, it worked out pretty good for Mr. Motlow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's worked out pretty good for pretty yeah. Good. Yeah. our families for a lot well, of years. Well, my, my father loved Jimmy Kelly. Yeah. And, 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 they were they were such great pals. When 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 Daddy would come in the restroom, uh, 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 Mr. Butler would come over and and greet him in such an affectionate way. Mr. Kelly, uh, pardon me, Mr. Kelly, yeah, Mr. Kelly, yeah, excuse me, I said Mr. Butler, uh, such an affectionate way. You could tell that there was real friendship. You know, I mean, they really cared about each other, and that was true till the uh, till my father died. To, to, uh, uh, Jimmy Kelly, I'm so happy to be here. Uh -huh. Cheers. It's always our pleasure. That's a great story. Great story. Great story. To Jimmy Kelly and to my father. To your father. Your father's a wonderful man. A really special man. Mike heard that John Day was coming tonight, and he really needs to film that story. So that's what we're doing. Now we'll cut off the light. Yeah, cut off the light.